A very warm welcome wherever you're watching and welcome to this CNBC debate live from Davos. Um, the timing of this event is extraordinary. We've just had the European Central Bank step up to the plate with a QE program that the markets have decided they can work with. The topic of our debate here today is recharging Europe. And no doubt we're going to talk a little bit in the context of recharging Europe about what QE is going to mean for Europe going forward. I have a wonderful panel here for you today, so let's introduce them. Let's start with Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister. Welcome. George Soros is here from the Soros Foundation. We have Ignizio Visco, the governor of the Italian Central Bank. George Osborne, the UK Chancellor. And Luis de Guindos, sitting right next to me, the Spanish Finance Minister. Thank you for all being with us on this CNBC debate and thank you, our audience, for the very warm reception. So let us um, get started here with the first question. And I'd like, if possible, to ask you, Governor Visco, because we've had this significant announcement from the European Central Bank. You were part of the process. Why was the size and timing more important than the element of risk sharing? Well, you never compare various elements. It was important to have a decision that was a consensus decision. We had a unanimity in deciding that this was a tool that can be used for monetary policy. And we had a very large majority, a very large majority, to decide that this was the moment to use it. The consensus was important because this is a single monetary policy decision. We are a central bank for the euro area. And we look at the euro area. We don't look at individual countries in the decision. Then there was an issue which was uh, very importantly considered by some, some of us. Uh, others uh, didn't uh, consider it very much. That uh, given the fact that we are not in a fiscal union, then risks uh, have to be uh, carefully evaluated. But I think this is uh, a secondary element vis-a-vis -vis the size the composition and the timing of the decision. So you're very comfortable that in no way does the 80% burden falling on national central banks, that in no way damages the foundation of the Eurozone, that there should be mutuality. No, I agree with that. This is uh, an element which was discussed. There is a risk of financial fragmentation that we some, some emphasized. There is a counterpart. Uh, the fact that uh, we, we are going to be pretty sure that uh, there will be behavior on the part of governments that will make risks less than they may appear, and this implies that interest rates may benefit from that. Um, you are all in some way part of the process or the machinery of government and policy making, except George Soros, who is a market participant Although I understand, George, from your dinner the other night, you claim to be less actively involved in the hedge fund than you used to be. But let me ask you, you've been a vocal critic of what you've perceived to be Germany's reluctance to allow fiscal and monetary policy to assist Europe at this difficult time of crisis. Did Germany just get outmaneuvered or does this package still fall short of what we need in Europe? Well, uh, I remain a critic uh, because a, a balance between fiscal policy and monetary policy would do the job better and it would not create other imbalances which, uh, as, uh, 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 relying only on monetary policy, can create, uh, because it works uh, in depressing the, the value of the, of the euro, which of course helps ex exports, uh, and of course it will uh, um, create 
uh, possibility of an asset bubble, which can have other uh, negative effects. But uh, the, my main concern, actually, is that it will uh, make uh, the divergence between rich and poor uh, bigger uh, than, than, it, uh, than it already is, because it will benefit the owners of, of, of assets. Uh, and actually, uh, wages will remain under pressure through competition and uh, uh, un uh, unemployment. Uh, so uh, this will, I think, uh, uh, reinforce a, a major concern, which is the difference between rich and poor. Uh, and it will have uh, political consequences. We have seen dramatic movements on the single currency. The euro has dropped below 112 even as we speak here. That's the first time since 2003. In spite of your concerns, the policy is having its expected effect, isn't it? It's starting to make the market's expectations change. De definitely. The sheer size of, of the, the massive uh, injection uh, and, and the duration and so on uh, will have undoubtedly an, an effect. Uh, it will also have, of course, uh, a, a lot of effect on international currency markets. And if I were uh, still active in, in, the, in the business, I could see some f fairly substantial moves coming. And uh, uh, financial instability can also have, uh, can create dislocations and uh, turmoil from time to time. So those are the negative effects. And all this would be better if you had a, a better balance between fiscal policy and, and uh, monetary policy. Ladies and gentlemen, um, there'll be time to call your brokers when we get to the end of the programme, OK? <laughs> so don't rush to take your phones out quite yet. Um, Finance Minister Schäuble, can I come to you? At the end of the day, was it more important, do you think, to preserve the perceived independence of the European Central Bank than uphold German objections to QE? Look, the independence of the central bank in Europe is given and it's to be respected. And therefore, we have that is the problem for, of the underlying problem of the European Currency Union. We have one monetary policy, but we have different fiscal and economic policy. And therefore, the burden for the ECB is very high to, to stick with one monetary policy, but with different. Therefore, I don't comment uh, decisions by ECB, never, never ever, because the monetary policy is up to the Central European Central Bank. And they do their job very well. And I trust. That is not the problem. We have, uh, we as government have to care on fiscal policy and then economic policy. By the way, we do it in Germany rather good. I think uh, George uh, Osborne has listened carefully uh, to Mr. Soros uh, in, in some way, because uh, don't, uh, don't forget the lessons of history. Uh, and uh, having said this, because I must do as say this, I would like to say, if I got it right, the president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, in presenting the decision of the ECB yesterday in TV, said, don't believe that monetary policy can prevent growth. That's up to national politics, fiscal policy, economic policy. Therefore, we, we have to care on growth. They have to fight. They have to, uh, to, to, to prevent price stability. That is the mandate of CCB. They, they do it very well, and they have to fight the risk of deflation. That's fine. I will not comment. But they can't, and that is the, the only problem we see, what is called the moral hazard. It would, some people could misunderstand that they have not to do what they have to do as governments, as parliaments, and so on, because uh, to implement structural reforms is always a difficult political task. I can be, because uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, you need majorities, stable majorities okay. in member states. That is uh, our job. Therefore, I will not intervene in the discussion on the decision on the monetary policy. It's fine. We do our job, and I think uh, we, we, uh, we have strengthened uh, 
uh, economy and, uh, and, and fiscal policy. Well, let, let me break in, in for a moment. Of so I think we're very clear on what your position is with regard to structural reform. Um, but let me ask you again, um, is this in any way likely to increase German fears of backdoor deficit financing now for countries like France, perhaps, maybe Italy, that are perceived to have been slow on structural reforms? Look, I, I, I know what I am saying, and I know what you would want to, what I would say, but I, I don't want the same to say what you want to me to say. <laughs> <laughs> to be very clear. This, uh, this... We, we, we are, once again, of course, you, you can see in, 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 in of course, in German uh, media, there is uh, a very difficult reaction on the decision on the DCB yesterday, but that's the independency of institutions, and that is, uh, that is one of the principles of, of Western democracy, that you have checks and balances and independent institutions, but if you, are, if you are convinced that the independency of the institution is right, and I'm totally convinced, well, then you have to respect and you must not ask who has been defeated or well, so let, let, let you me have to tell. Everyone has to, has, has to stick to its own responsibility. My responsibility is fiscal policy, economic policy. Well, perhaps you can comment then on some of the reaction, because in the German papers today, there are Germans who have been asked how they feel, and one of the, one of the quotes was, this is what has happened to my money. So the message very clearly from the German public is this is not a welcome step. I, I, I have read it, yes. <laughs> but you, you, look, it's, 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 I think we should not waste our time to play a game I will not, I will not play. To be All, right. Sure. All right, let's move on and we can come back to you in, in just a moment. Um, um, Chancellor Osborne, um, if I can come to you. Um, firstly, just to clarify um, Britain's position in this debate, um, are you in or out? of the EU. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we want to be in a reformed uh, EU. And um, I, I'm tempted to say the lesson from history, uh, which uh, George Soros taught the United Kingdom, is when you fix your exchange rate with other European economies, it opens mm. up a heap of troubles, uh, as uh, we have seen. And uh, uh, you know, my view is that Europe needs to be the place, Britain included, that is the centre of business innovation and science and discovery and education, as it has been for much of uh, the recent history of the world. And uh, all the nations of the European Union have an obligation to their populations, many of whom are unemployed, mm. uh, many of whom lack economic opportunity, to make the reforms necessary. And, uh, you know, where I agree with Wolfgang, um, from what he, you know, he implies, is that uh, the European Central Bank action by itself welcome as it is, uh, is not going to solve the problem. It is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition of European recovery. And the uh, countries of the Eurozone need to use this opportunity now to do the structural reforms, to get their public finances in order, uh, to make the changes that are going to attract business and investment from around the world to mm. Europe. They've got this opportunity. There is a window now, and governments in Italy and France and the like need to take that opportunity. And I, you know, I should say, uh, this is not a, you know, I, I, sometimes there's, there's probably a sort of unremitting uh, feeling to the uh, eurozone problems. But actually, if you look at what Spain has done, you know, mm. Spain in a, was in a desperate situation two or three years ago but took some very difficult uh, decisions on labour market reform and the like, and is benefiting. You can see investment flowing to Spain in the way that it is not flowing to some other Eurozone countries. So mm. uh, I would say Ireland is another example uh, yeah. of uh, people who are getting it right. So uh, I think there is in front of us examples of Eurozone economies that have taken difficult decisions and are being rewarded for it. Equally, of course, there are examples of Eurozone mm. countries who have not taken sufficient action and are being punished for that. Your party has pledged to have a referendum. So are you in or out? Well, I want us to be in a reformed European Union, but mm. two, there are two conditions. One is the whole of Europe, uh, as I say, Britain included, needs to undertake that economic reform. The EU needs to be a job-creating uh, organisation. Uh, second, the United Kingdom is the second largest economy in the European Union, the second largest contributor. Indeed, on projections, uh, we are going to be the largest economy in the European Union by 2030. 
Now, we have interests and rights that need to be respected as a non-Eurozone member. We're not going to join the Euro. Yeah. And at the moment, the treaties of the European Union, I do not think, uh, adequately reflect this situation where you have a large member state that is not going to join the Euro, yeah. uh, is not part of the central, um, uh, you know, centralising project of the European Union. Uh, and uh, we're, we're happy with that. It's our decision not to be part of the Euro. But the treaties need to reflect the changes that that uh, causes. Also, the uh, economic differentials it can bring about, the pressures it can bring about through things like free movement of people. So yep. there are changes that need to be made, but I'm confident we can achieve those changes. And by the way, I think they also fit in with other changes that need to be made to the treaties to, for example, put the monetary union on a sounder legal footing. OK. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, maybe we can have a go at this ourselves. Who would like the UK to stay within the EU? And maybe I could ask the panellists to raise their hands on this one as well. <laughs> Who would like the UK to stay inside the EU? If I could ask uh, you to give us a show European of hands. Union. The reformed European Union is what we want. Ask the counter question. <laughs> OK, I'll ask the counter question. Who would like the UK to leave the EU? Who thinks it would be either a better EU or a better UK if it were outside? Wow. OK, well, I think that's fairly definitive, <laughs> isn't it? Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, they, there you go. Maybe that will the shelter the election. It's not actually going to be conducted uh, at the World Economic Forum. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfo I think we could, we could probably solve a lot of problems if we just got on with this. Um, uh, Mr De Guindos, let, let me come to you, Minister. Um, George Soros has talked about the risks of QE, basically putting wealth into the pockets of those who already own assets. As Chancellor Osborne points out, Spain has come a remarkable way in improving its growth dynamics, and that's showing up in all the key data points at this stage. But do you think that large body of unemployed people in Spain are going to be prepared to stand by and see the owners of assets get wealthier as a result of QE? Will we have a problem with inequality in Spain, and will that lead to nationalism? Well, uh, the first thing that I have to say is that in 2014, unemployment in Spain has dropped by almost half a million people. So it's uh, a stark contrast with the situation that uh, the dynamics of the labour market in Spain has been, uh, have been transformed. Secondly, um, I think that uh, you know, I endorse uh, always the decisions taken by the ECB. I, uh, as Wolfgang, we are firm believers in the independence of, uh, of central, central banks. But I think that there is one point. You cannot address structural problems with monetary policy. Monetary policy is not, it's not all, uh, an almighty instrument. You have to address the structural problems with supply-side reforms. And I think that the case of Spain is quite uh, relevant in this, uh, in this situation. In Spain, we were, as you have said, on the brink three years ago. We implemented uh, a very ambitious uh, reform agenda. We restructured our banks. We uh, overhauled uh, our labor market regulation. And we have started uh, to reap the rewards of those policies. Uh, now Spain is growing above 2%. We have reduced our fiscal deficit. Uh, the dynamics of the labor market are totally different. We have a current account surplus. So I think that is a good example about, uh, you know, the kind of policies that we should implement. But you I still have deflation. No, but the deflation in Spain is because, uh, is because of the evolution of oil prices. You know, because, has been, you know, because of the reforms that we have taken in the energy market very rapidly. Perhaps Spain is the, the, the market where, you know, this translation of uh, wholesale oil prices more rapidly go into the price at the pump. Hmm? We have, uh, you know, any negative inflation rate, but uh, this is positive. This is a positive sign that, uh, you know, in Spain, oil prices are reducing the inflation rate. And it's not because we have deflation. It's totally different. The, the deflation is like cholesterol. There are two kinds of deflations, the bad one and the good one. <laughs> you know, in Spain, we have, uh, you know, the good kind uh, of deflation. That is the deflation that is favoring, you know, the pockets of the households. Well, what about the rest of the euro area? Have they got the good kind of cholesterol deflation? 
<laughs> well, I think that, uh, you know, in the rest of the Euro area, perhaps not with the intensity of Spain, mm. but, uh, you know, we have a similar situation. There is no deflation. Deflation, this, deflation the, uh, you know, deflation is a vicious circle. It's a combination of the expectation of lower prices that delays expenditure decisions. And this is not taking place in, in, in Spain. Just, just very briefly, I mean, there is a chance that the Spanish economy will do 2% or 2% plus this year. That was already forecast before we had the announcement mm -hmm. from the European Central Bank. Mm -hmm. um, was it actually necessary, given that there's an improvement in some of the lending data as well, mm -hmm. coming up to this announcement, was it necessary to have this this amount of QE delivered at this point in Europe's turnaround? Well, as I have told you, I do not comment on the decisions. I always endorse the decisions of the, of the ECB. But I can tell you one thing. If you look at, uh, you know, the flows of new credit in Spain, you know, they are on the rise since uh, 12 months ago. So uh, this is something that is, uh, that is important. It has to do especially with the restructuring of the banking industry in Spain. So, you know, the decision of the, of the central bank is welcome. I think that is very important. I think that they are sticking to uh, its mandate. But I think that, uh, you know, when you improve, for instance, the banking, in, banking industry, when you improve, for instance, the dynamics of the labor market, labor and capital is much more mobile. And so the monetary stimuli are transferred to the real economy much more softly are much more efficient than uh, when you do not have this kind of reforms. George Soros, if I could just come to you off the back of this conversation, because you've put money into Santander. Warren Buffett has opened an office in Madrid. Um, it seems to me that the money is going where it believes the reforms are taking place. Does that mean the reforms aren't taking place in Italy, France, Portugal, or any of the other members that I haven't named, outside of Germany, of course? Well, when I'm talking about fiscal stimulus, I'm talking about a European fiscal st stimulus. There is one source of uh, first-class AAA credit that is totally unused, and that's the credit of the European Union itself. If, if that were used for <coughs> European infrastructure projects that would pay for themselves, particularly with the current rate of interest, you, you would have, uh, 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 you would create uh, employment, uh, you would create a, a growing economy, you would actually have uh, the euro uh, appreciate rather than depreciate. And I think it would be very much in Germany's interest uh, to use that credit uh, for the benefit, uh, because Germany itself has a very uh, rundown um, uh, infrastructure. They built a, a new port that is now can export uh, 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 very, uh, very rapidly and so on. But the roads leading to the port are full of potholes. So it, it would be for, for Germany's benefit. And it would also reassure the German public that the currency is, is uh, appreciating, that, that the re retirees what are about, not losing their... What about Mr. Juncker's 315 billion fund? Maybe we could use that to fill some of the potholes. Well, is, is, exactly it enough, right. is it enough to help stimulate Europe on the fiscal front? Well, I think if you had uh, that uh, uh, money... Uh, 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 supported by European credit, you would need uh, less uh, monetary stimulus. You would have a better balance, and you wouldn't have this, uh, 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 both in the, in the, in the uh, uh, exchange rate and, and in the uh, relationship of rich and poor, you wouldn't have this disequilibrium developing. Minister Schäuble, um, your body language suggests that you don't really buy into the proposals that Mr. Soros has laid out. I don't know whether uh, uh, Mr. Soros is the best expert in German uh, fiscal and economic policy, by the way. Uh, we look, we have, um, we have achieved it, even in last year, with all this uh, uncertainty, the growth by 1.5. That's not so bad. We have, uh, we have, uh, uh, raising our uh, expenditure for research and development. We have by far 
the highest uh, rate of uh, the uh, expenditure for, for uh, research and, and, and development in all European countries. And we do this since, since a lot of years. It's not by, by, by fortune that we have a better uh, uh, economic development than other member states, because we invested in research and development. We will invest more in infrastructure. It's a matter, it's a matter of, uh, not only on, on federal level, but also on uh, 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 um, uh, state government and local government. We have, in, we have uh, 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 strongly supported uh, uh, the economic situation, the uh, budget situation of local uh, communities by, by, with federal money, which is difficult in line with our constitution. I think it's always a little bit more uh, differentiated if you look at, at, the, at the different problems. We will, we will incre increase our investment rate in the coming years again and again. We will use all the room of maneuver uh, which we have with our fiscal policy because uh, we, are, we are sticking to the rules of the European Pact on Stability and Growth. We, we started, uh, uh, when I became finance minister, we had a, a, a debt to GDP ratio a rate by 80%. On behalf of European rules, we have to bring it down to 60%. And some member states take European rules as serious. And I think a, 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 a relation, a debt to GDP, by 130 percent. So, Herr Schäuble, who on and, the panel? And therefore, and therefore who, in this line, we will, um, in this line, we will spend any euro to increase investment. We do it in, in, in def different ways. We do it on the national level. We have already uh, uh, agreed uh, by by a network of uh, uh, banks for development, the KFW, to other to other developing banks all over Europe. Uh, by th three billion, three billion euro bilaterally, we do it to to, to support other investment and well, we will contribute. I'm not to sure we have time to run through the German budget for 2015. Yeah, but but you, let, let me just say, can if I ask you, you? If I if I am asked on, on German fiscal policy, I have okay. to explain well, because I know it better than everyone but you, else. You've, you've... <laughs> But you, you, you've, you've said some things here that I think do need an answer. Who, who on this panel is not abiding by the rules? Who in Europe is not abiding by the rules? Or you can look at the different uh, rules of the Pact on Stability and Growth. There are debt rules, there are deficit rules. We will discuss it uh, Monday, Tuesday, in Brussels, in the Eurogroup, and in the ECOFIN. I, I will not... Uh, everybody knows, and therefore I must not mention. I only think <coughs> we stick to the rules, and I will tell you, if you want to fight Euroscepticism in the population, what is an, and what even Mr. Soros has mentioned, you must tell people that you can trust that agreements which have been taken by every member state are taken serious. Because if that is not the case, you, you get problems all over Europe. And you can see it. And by the way, if you want to, to get growth in Germany, you need some demand. We have the highest consumer demand we used to have in the last decades because we have regained by our fiscal policy the confidence of consumers that our fiscal policy okay. is sustainable. That's not so bad. But we come back to this old debate as to whether it is actually easier to make those reforms while you have growth. Um, I think... Uh, Chancellor Osborne, you often talk about umbrellas and patching umbrellas or patching roofs um, to prepare yourself for the next crisis. So, Fixing not, the roof when the sun is shining. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure how the UK would fare under um, Herr Schäuble's very strict definition of the, the rules and their implementation. But let, let me ask you on that question. Uh, a lot of countries in Europe are being forced to take dramatic action at a time when they have limited growth and a bit more... Fiscal flexibility at this time surely would be no bad thing. Well, I agree with uh, Wolfgang that uh, fiscal credibility leads to consumer confidence and investor confidence. Uh, and uh, it is always the case that there are people who say spend more money. They spend more money in good years because you can afford it, spend more money in bad years because you need it. There's always an argument for increasing borrowing. But uh, we had a sovereign debt crisis in Europe uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, it is still the case that uh, too many of the uh, public finances of uh, European nations 
uh, are not on a sound footing. And in the UK's case, you know, I inherited a budget deficit of almost 11% of GDP, the highest that the UK had endured outside of a war. Uh, we have halved that deficit uh, as a percentage of our national income, but it's still 5%. You know, that is too high. And the idea that at this point, a country like the United Kingdom gives up uh, on the progress we've made, uh, allows the borrowing to soar, uh, leaves itself exposed to whatever uh, the world throws at it with a debt-to-GDP ratio of 80%. That's just not acceptable. And it wouldn't be me doing my job of trying to provide economic security for my country. Uh, so we've got to go on uh, dealing with our budget deficit, eliminating that deficit. I think in good times you should run surpluses to bring your uh, debt down and insulate yourself uh, better against uh, global shocks. Now, that, I think, by setting out a clear plan alongside, in the UK's case, uh, activist monetary policy, uh, structural reform, clear leadership. If you put those things together, you have an economic plan. And the UK has benefited, I think, from having a clear economic plan with the fastest growing, we've been the fastest growing major economy in the world in 2014. Our unemployment has fallen faster than any time in our history. Uh, it fell again this week. Uh, so the benefits are there. Uh, the investment is flowing in. The UK is now the go-to location for a lot of international investment. So the benefits of hanging the pan, and I think all of that would be lost if you started uh, turning on the spending taps. And whatever thing you bought for that money uh, would be more than outweighed by the things you would lose because the investment would flow away, uh, the jobs would be lost, business confidence would disappear because ultimately consumer confidence that your country had got its act together would disappear. Governor Visco, um, Italy's unemployment level is double Germany's in spite of the Jobs Act uh, that has been um, implemented, uh, that Prime Minister Renzi has pushed through. Um, 11 out of the last 13 quarters have seen GDP fall. Can I ask you, um, has Italy really begun the reform process yes, properly I will give, at this stage? I will give the answer immediately. First, if you allow me, I'd just like to say one word to complete the discussion that uh, had been <coughs> started on... Uh, deflation risks, whether we are in or not. The, the main problem that we faced was low inflation and much lower than the level that we consider to be consistent with price stability. This has an implication on real interest rates. If inflation expectations start to fall following the low, low level of inflation, then the real interest rates can only go up because we are at the zero lower bound. This has effects on the real economy all through Europe. So this is a material risk and we in the central bank don't look at individual countries, we look at the euro area. This is our mandate and this is why we did what we did. At the same time, we didn't do something dramatic. We had a fall in our balance sheet of one third in two years and a half. That means 30% less of creation of money. So we are creating, compensating, creating the money that was there. In the United States, the Federal Reserve increased the money supply by 60%. Uh, the Bank of England by 15% up. So it is clear quantitative easing in our case is different also in the effects than uh, elsewhere. We have mostly a banking sector that finances the real economy. Mm. So there will be different channels. We are trying also to have other channels besides the banks to be affected. On Italy, uh, first of all, the Jobs Act and the unemployment rate are unrelated because the unemployment built up before the Jobs Act was introduced. So it, uh, the issue is whether these will help and, uh, it, and whether this is uh, in the reform agenda, the first reform. But first of all, I think that reforms are there at least since the sovereign crisis. And there have been a sequence of reforms. The problem is that there are two problems. One is that they have not appeared to be within a comprehensive package. So they have been one at a time in the judiciary, in the area of professional services, in the uh, labor reform, in pension reform, very important pension reform. Italy is one of the countries that is more stable on that side with aging because of that pension reform. But at the same time, what is miss missing is growth. 
notwithstanding this sequence of reforms, growth has not picked up. There are reasons for that. Credit crunch during the sovereign uh, rate. Sovereign Political reasons for that? Well, I mean, is that, it the instability politically in Italy the, the that's been the problem? The most important one is uncertainty. And one of the uncertainties that are relevant is political uncertainty. I made a statement in Parliament recently discussing a number of things. And one issue that was obvious is that while we had in Germany Minister Schäuble for the three years which I've been governor of the Bank of Italy, always there, I had five finance ministers. So this is a major problem. We need certainty for investment. You cannot have reforms that are pushed and then when the new government comes, there is a question on the part of entrepreneurs or foreign investors, will those reforms will still be in place? We have to have a stability of reforms. Obviously, monetary policy cannot deliver real growth, productivity growth, innovation, and so on. It, it can deliver, however, our uh, source of uh, uh, reduction of uncertainty, stability on uh, the price level. Well, that begs the question then, will this current government actually last to push through those reforms? It is going on. We are pretty considering positively what is being done. We had reforms in the, on the bureaucratic uh, problems, corruption in the past, but the big problem is implementation. And so on the implementation side, this government will be judged. It has to follow up, it has to be effective in that, and if it does, there is a lot of opportunities in the country. We are lagging behind a number in a number of areas that only picking up that in that sector, in that in those sectors could really benefit a lot. For the time being, potential growth is just an extrapolation of past growth. But we need a discontinuity here. And this is what is the challenge for the government. I mean, I, I think you raise a very interesting question that we can, we can link together the panel on this. Uh, and let me bring it up with you, Mr. De Guindos. Um, we talked about the Germans do not want their money transferred to places where they perceive there is instability. The question, I think, um, that perhaps you could help answer at this point, have the other members of the Eurozone that have challenges with their economies at the moment displayed enough commitment for the German <coughs> taxpayer to trust them? Well, I think that, uh, you know, there is one point that perhaps we are overlooking a little bit, uh, and, and I can't tell you why. I think that... Solid solidarity within the boundaries of the Eurozone has been uh, quite uh, sizable. And I, let me put you an example. Greece. The Eurozone has lent to Greece 210 billion euros. Do you know what's the contribution of Spain? 26 billion euros. Our exposure to Greece is 26 billion euros. That's more or less what uh, we uh, spent in unemployment benefits in one year in Spain. That is a country with uh, an unemployment rate above 23%. So uh, I think that solidarity is there. And the solidarity has been shared uh, among the different, the different countries. How many times, Wolfgang, we have reprofiled the loans to Greece? I think that two or three times, continuously. We have extended the maturities. We have reduced the interest rates. So the solidarity, the solidarity uh, is there. We are not thinking about the taxpayer in Spain. We are not thinking about the taxpayer in, in Germany. We are thinking about a political and economic and financial project that is the euro. Well, Spiegel says Chancellor Merkel has looked at a plan that would allow Greece to leave the Eurozone. So apparently the Germans have been doing some modelling on what the Eurozone would like without Greece. Or is Spiegel wrong? Look, um, if, I, if I would uh, care on, what, on any, any uh, uh, file which is in media, so I, would, uh, so so I would not uh, get uh, in, in, in 48 hours a day uh, my, my, my job done. It is totally clear we have proven. Look at the, look at the facts. We have proven in years and years, as Louis Kindus just mentioned, that we did uh, what, whatever could be done to, to, to uh, support Greece in, in, difficult, in difficult times again and again. Uh, and I can tell you all the whole, the whole story on this. We had, uh, we had to 
to convince IMF to make very extraordinary concessions in, in, in line with the IMF rules that we could uh, support this. I could tell you endless, nightless, when Louis was, already, was not already a finance minister at the time, uh, endless uh, discussions over nights and nights when we supported again and again and again Greece. We, we did, Germany did it by, uh, by the way, additionally, ad bilaterally, a lot of things for Greece. Therefore, it's not a matter of uh, this. It's always nonsense. But if someone is saying in Greece, we don't need any program, we believe it. OK, if I am right in, in reading the decision of the ECB yesterday, that we can ask governor, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, if Greece has no program, Greece will not be take uh, will not take part in the QE on behalf of the citizen of, of the ECB. How should we how should we treat the commentary? Therefore, therefore, I think we will wait on the election in Greece on Sunday, and then we will see whoever win elections. That's up to the Greek people to decide. I have already uh, uh, seen the two elections in in uh, early 2012, uh, and 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 whenever. The Greek people had to decide. They decided that they had to do what they can in a very difficult situation. But the reason for the problems of the Greek people is not, is not Europe, it's not European Union, it's not Brussels, it's not Berlin. The, the reason for the problem of the Greek people, and that, has, that should Greek political leaders tell their population, are the mistakes in the past for a long time. That is the truth, and anything else is not the truth. Oh. Against this backdrop, we have um, Cyprus saying things like, what's been imposed on Greece is like <coughs> fiscal waterboarding. Now, let me perhaps ask yeah, you again. It's a way of campaigning. You may like it or not. I don't like it. <laughs> but let me ask you again, because I, I don't remember you answering the question, has Germany modelled Greece's exit, yes or no? We don't model any exit. We, we, are, we are in favour that the Eurozone sticks together, and we did whatever we can together with all our partners, with all institutions, to make this. And we have proven this. Therefore, but I do not intervene in campaigning uh, 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 in any member states. That, that is uh, up to them. They have to do. But look, if you look and see OECD, you have just mentioned before, you should uh, structural reforms. You should deliver in good times. That's true. That's the theory. The practice in politics is that normally you can only get structural reforms decided in times when you are under, under pressure. That is the reality in politics. In good times, you like to be a little bit more uh, 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 not, not, so, not so decided. But, and but having said this, uh, if you look on the last OECD report, which member state of OECD have performed best in implementing structural reforms, the five member states under different European assistance programs, Spain in the lead, Ireland, Portugal, Cyprus and Greece has best performed in implementing structural reforms. Therefore, the conditionality in the, in the given European programs was something of uh, fiscal and monet uh, uh, economic union we don't have in the, in the governance of the Eurozone, but, but it's one of, the, of underlying structural problems in the Eurozone, that we have only a common monetary policy. Therefore, Greece has in any way, being member of the Eurozone or not, Greece, Greece has to suffer major structural reforms to become competitive. Otherwise, Greece will never uh, be able, as member of the Eurozone or not, uh, to, to stand to the, ex to the expectation political leaders raise in campaigning okay. with the people of Greece. OK, I, I don't want this to get too negative. So let's talk about some positives and let's no, talk about some positive. things that we can... We they can... have implemented structural reforms. They had made, well, it, well, it sounded a bit like a horse race, the way you were describing the, the reform programs. Look, Mr. Kappas, the truth is Greece has made impressive progress, better than we expected two years ago. Much more. The growth is better in Greece. The, redu the, the uh, reduction of deficit is better. They had achieved for the first time in decades a primary surplus. <laughs> Therefore, they are in the right way. The expectation of the calculation of IMF is that Greece will have in 2020 
uh, a debt to a GDP ratio by 100 2012. Two years ago, the expectation was they will be far above 120 in 2020. They are better than expected. They are doing very well. They have made impressive progress. And, and of course... That almost sounds like a campaign speech, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen. But, but let's move on here. Um, Chancellor Osborne, I wanted to come to you because something that the UK has achieved, which I think many countries would like to see replicated, as you have taken out some public sector jobs and reduced salaries in that area or frozen them, we've actually seen the private sector step in and we've seen companies pick up some of the slack in the labour market. We're seeing good jobs growth in the UK. and We're also now starting to see wages inching up, almost the holy grail of getting us to a, to a virtuous circle, if you like. How has the UK done it when it hasn't been achieved in other economies in Europe at this stage? Well, first of all, uh, you know, the UK five years ago was in a very difficult situation. So uh, I agree with um, Wolfgang that often it takes a very difficult economic situation for a nation to have to face up to the difficult decisions that are required. Uh, second, we set out uh, as a new government uh, five years ago a clear plan and we have delivered that plan. We've, we've uh, I think, earned trust by saying what we were going to do and then doing it. And was uh, that £375 billion of bond buying also critical to encouraging those private individuals to invest alongside you? Well, I think the uh, Bank of England... Uh, its activist monetary policy made it easier and has made it easier to deliver the fiscal uh, retrenchment and the economic reform. Um, I don't think by itself it would have done the job, uh, but it was part of and is part of a, an economic plan. Uh, so that plan commands confidence. I think you know, the, the European publics are well aware that our countries face big questions about how we're going to earn our living in the future, not just coming out of... Eurozone crisis or financial crisis, uh, but a big challenge to our continent, which is, is this going to be the place that's creating prosperity and higher living standards and jobs in the future? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, politicians who front up to that, who tell their publics that, you know, there are no free lunches, uh, that there aren't uh, easy decisions out there, it's going to be, uh, you know, difficult, but the rewards are for those who take those difficult decisions, that, you know, that um, fortune favours those with a clear vision, a clear economic plan and clear leadership. And, uh, you know, I hope, uh, obviously, we've got an election coming up in the UK. You know, I hope people will see the progress we've made. Uh, I think the public understand there's been a, a huge uh, amount done, but they also understand there's a huge amount more to do, uh, that the journey is not complete. Uh, just let me be very clear here. Uh, a tax cut for oil services businesses operating in the North Sea is not a free lunch. Well, um, the, the oil price uh, fall, um, I think, has, is you know, going to be very significant for the European economy, including the UK. Uh, and it's a very positive thing for uh, Europe. Uh, and it puts money into the hands of consumers and businesses. Uh, in the UK, it is a positive thing. But, of course, it has a big impact also on the North Sea oil and gas sector. It's a mature basin. It's a, it's a, a brilliant industry. Uh, but, of course, it's going to be affected when the oil price halves. Uh, and so we've already started to take action. At the beginning of this month, I cut some of the taxes we levy uh, on the North Sea, uh, because not because I expect to see a return tomorrow on that, uh, not because I'm claiming it's going to pay for itself, uh, but because I want to make sure in 10 years' time and 15 years' time we're still pulling oil and gas out of the North Sea, that that brilliant industry in Aberdeen uh, is uh, thriving. And uh, it's a classic, you know, with four months to go to a general election, mm. uh, you wouldn't normally have a UK chancellor uh, contemplating further reductions in the tax on the oil and gas sector. Mm. Uh, but because actually we are uh, investing in the long-term economic future of this country, it is something, of course, we are looking at. And, uh, it is, and I think the public understand that. They understand that ultimately, uh, if you don't make those sort of long-term decisions for your economy, uh, you lose jobs, you lose living, your living standards fall. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, people in Britain went through that five or six years ago, so they have a fairly recent example uh, in, fresh in their memory of what happens when economic policy is short-termist, fails, relies on borrowed money, uh, and I, I'm confident the British probably don't want to go back. 
George Soros, let me come to you. Um, you have said that you, you are not as bullish on the current state of the market, well, uh, on the markets, as many who are active in the markets seem to be at this point. One of the important elements of QE and the kind of restoration of confidence that Chancellor Osborne has talked about is the need for the markets also to allow animal spirits to a certain extent to run their course and there to be risk-taking by entrepreneurs. All of this may fall to naught if the markets don't work with the bankers and with the finance ministers. What are the risks here, do you think, that we don't get that release of risk-taking and animal spirits? Well, uh, you need uh, uh, less uncertainty. So to the extent, to the, uh, uh, extent you have, let's say, instability in, uh, in exchange rates, that's a negative. Uh, insofar as you have political uncertainties, and I would like to uh, emphasize, because most of the disturbing things today, the things that can go wrong, are actually political. And we've been focusing here on, only on the economy. And I think we would make a big mistake not to consider uh, the political situation globally. That's really... Uh, You're not uh, just talking about George Osborne not getting re-elected uh, in May. This no, is no, something else. No, I, I'm talking about, uh, for instance, the, the threat posed by, uh, by Russia, a resurgent Russia. I, I, the European public and apparently many of the leaders are not sufficiently aware of that danger. And uh, Europe doesn't behave like uh, uh, an association of countries that is under attack. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one of the major uh, uncertainties. And it's really up to the international uh, authorities uh, to provide Ukraine the financial support that it needs in order to stand up to an actual military and, and financial assault, which is an assault on the very foundations of the values that the European Union is based on. So that's one very important thing we should uh, talk more about. But on, but on the whole, on, on the whole, I think the, 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 uh, there is a very positive development coming from the, the uh, uh, central bank. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's the only uh, instrument that is actually uh, acting. Uh, there is a, a lack on the, fi on the fiscal side, but uh, the, the, uh, you should not, nevertheless not underestimate the importance of the sheer uh, physical mass of money uh, pouring into, uh, into the markets. And I'm sure that there'll be lots of animal spirits, but they'll be devoted more to, to, to making more money than actually making long-term investments. Thank you. Uh, Minister Schäuble, could I get Germany or, or the German perspective on Russia, as George Soros expounds it? I think um, it is a little bit um, difficult to, to touch this very difficult issue in one minute in a discussion when we if of course, the, the, the political framework is of, of upper, uh, most important, by sure. And uh, of course, we have uh, German government, German federal councillor, uh, together with all their colleagues, we have uh, cared whatever we can do. It's a difficult situation. We don't. Uh, but I, I, I don't think that we are, to be very frank, the right forum to discuss in a serious way the Ukraine issue as, as well. That makes that, of course, political uncertainty is always a bad framework for growth. But if we want to discuss the Ukraine-Russian uh, issue serious, we should ask maybe our colleague foreign ministers and so on and not to do it in, 
in, uh, by, by occasion in two minutes. That makes no real sense. All right. Well, let's, let's just uh, point out that there are seven elections, at least, in key economies across the Eurozone. I think the political issue is going to be significant in terms of risk this year. I think Spain has an election to come at the end of the year. So let's not just focus on the UK, but you're one of many countries that are facing this political visa economic challenge this year. Is there in any sense a real risk that we might see the EU founder through this political process? Well, you are totally right. In the case of Spain, we have two, two elections. We have general elections at the end of the year and we have regional and local elections in, at the end of May. No? Well, that's democracy. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the point, uh, in my view, the important point is that, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of the Spanish uh, voter, the Spanish voter is wise, is sensible, is mature. I think that the Spanish voter is going to look backwards, is going to see where we stood three years ago. We were in the eye of the storm. We, go, we were on the brink. We were on the verge of collapse. And now Spain is growing. Uh, there is no room for complacency, for sure, but it's growing. We are, we are outperforming our uh, European and uh, uh, Eurozone partners. Uh, we have much better fundamentals in terms of macroeconomics. And the Spanish voter knows perfectly that uh, political stability is an advantage. So, for sure, that they will take into consideration all these elements and they will vote accordingly. So, uh, this is the only thing. Governments, got, what have to do, in the case of Spain, for instance, is to, to try to modify, to redirect an economy that was, uh, uh, that was you know, on the verge of collapse. And to have now an economy that is growing, that it has a very high unemployment rate, that you have to do a lot of things, but that the future is much better than it was three years ago. I think that this is going to be the real element that they are going to take into consideration. I hope you are right, but let's look at the, the example of the UK. Um, we have economic indicators improving in many areas. More people, and I'll say this, Chancellor, more people are in jobs in the UK than ever before. But the threat in the UK is not coming from the traditional left to this uh, Conservative Party. It's coming from an anti-incumbent UKIP party on the right. What does that tell us about the willingness of the European public and the British public at the moment to accept the status quo as they've had it since the financial crisis? Well, I think... It would be very surprising if you'd had uh, an economic shock of the kind that the UK experienced um, six or seven years ago, not to have uh, uh, that to have had an impact on the political system. I mean, the political system is a reflection of uh, the anxieties and the hopes and, and, and fears of uh, people living in the country. Uh, and you're right that um, the, old, the sort of traditional alternative to the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, has not provided uh, an answer. So people. Um, you know, who uh, are unhappy with a difficult decision the government has taken, look elsewhere for that answer. Uh, but I think as a, uh, in a general election, uh, and this isn't true so much uh, in European elections or local elections, but in a general election, you know, people know ultimately they've got to make a choice about who they want the Prime Minister to be, which economic policy <laughs> they want. And whenever you ask uh, these voters who say at the moment they will support one of these uh, um, minority parties, they do say they'd rather have David Cameron, they'd rather have the Conservative economic plan. So, you know, we have to focus people's minds on this election. We actually have to tell people it's a really important election, because it is. Britain faces a big choice uh, about the future direction of economic policy, about whether we go forward with the plan I've described or, or go backwards. Uh, and I think by communicating that clear choice, uh, by saying only two people can walk into the door of 10 Downing Street uh, on the uh, day after the election, uh, we will actually get people to support the government. Um, and I think in the end, people can judge us by our track record and by the platform we offer for a brighter future. We actually set ourselves the goal of the UK becoming the most prosperous of the major economies in the next generation. Uh, I think we can achieve that. So it's a, it's, it's a, a platform based on optimism about the future with a uh, track record of delivery. Um, you represent a country that is not part of the currency union, 
Um, one of the outcomes of the action that was taken yesterday is we've now seen the single currency falling very mm. rapidly. That is not going to help the competitiveness of the UK in international export markets. Is that a potential headwind this year? And may <coughs> that affect the political outcome in May? Well, look, we, we don't um, target an exchange rate um, because last time we tried, George Soros made a lot of money. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and so uh, we, we don't, as I say, um, try and uh, have a particular exchange rate in mind. We, we have a floating currency. Um, I, I think it's, it's in Britain's interests that our friends on the continent of Europe do well. It's clearly in our, we're, such, we're so interconnected as economies. And so I support anything that is going to improve growth rates in Italy and France and, and the like. Uh, and that is good for the UK because we export 50% of what we make to Europe, 40% uh, to the Eurozone. Uh, so we welcome any action that um, improves growth. But as I said at the beginning, it can't just be monetary action. It's got to be structural reform. It's got to be sound public finances. Um, and I think ultimately the competitiveness of our industry, the competitiveness of our exports does not depend on our exchange rate. It depends on us having a highly skilled workforce, great innovation, good science, good business investment decisions. You know, that's ultimately uh, what makes for great exports. Um, and because currency, you know, currencies can go up and down. George Soros, currencies can go up and down, but not when they're pegged. And then a peg gets removed and then we had that extraordinary hindsight moment where every economist tried to pretend they'd forecast the Swiss Central Bank removing the link. Can I ask you, that has now happened. Where next will these hot money flows go to cause trouble? Well, uh, uh, fortunately, I am genuinely not involved in the markets. So I'm not paying attention to that. I must say, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, sudden move, uh, I mean, uh, as you say, pegs are very dangerous because eventually they are liable to break. And if they, when they break, they are uh, a discreet uh, uh, shock uh, to a lot of economies. It will be a big shock uh, for, for Switzerland. And Switzerland will, will now face a, a uh, uh, an overvalued car currency and uh, uh, economic slowdown, but uh, it was an in inevitable move, and uh, certainly in retrospect, I could have foreseen it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Soros, thank you so much, and I just want to wrap up our program here with one final question on an election. There is an Italian presidential election coming up very soon. Um, Vithko, I've, I've seen your, uh, Governor Vithko, I've seen your name mentioned in connection with this. Um, should we get used to calling you president at some point soon? Should you allow me not to answer at all to this kind of question? <laughs> it, it is a, a, a question which should not be put, unless you really want to talk uh, with a coffee and, uh, and uh, some nice, nice uh, conversation. No, I mean, obviously you should not. I guess the way I you do these the of, uh, yes, I, I, think, I think the way you do these things is you deny, you deny, you deny until you uh, accept no, no, the position. No, 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 there is nothing. I've never been told anything. So, well, we, we look to forward to you running in the race. No. Um, <laughs> let me thank our panelists for their contributions and thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this special CNBC debate from the World Economic Forum in Davos.